Philippine Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello everyone, welcome to the biology class. Today we are going to learn chapter number 7 from your NCRT textbook, Evolution. So before we go into depth of this chapter, let us understand what is evolution. You have heard people saying fashion is evolving, technology is evolving. So what is the meaning of this term evolving? The word evolution means change. So when I say fashion is evolving, it means fashion is changing. A gradual change is taking place. So let's see what is the definition of evolution in biology. So it's a change in the heritable characteristics of biological population over successive generation. I have highlighted the main points here in red. You can see it's a change where in the heritable characteristics. That means those characteristics which are passed from one generation to the next. Then only it will be accumulated in the successive generation. Another definition could be it's a process. So evolution is process by which different kinds of living organisms have developed from earlier forms during the history of the earth. Now we know the history of the earth is quite long. So in all these millions of years, life has evolved from the earlier forms with gradual changes, fine? Now if I have to know how life evolved, I must know how planet evolved because we are ultimately talking about the life on this planet that is earth, fine? So let's see how earth was created and because earth is a part of the entire universe, let us also understand how universe was created. Now this is your uh, lower class knowledge where you have studied that universe is filled with billions of galaxies, trillions of stars along with uncountable number of planets, moons, asteroids, comets, uh, clouds, dust, all are spinning, swirling in the vast space. And how old is the universe? It's almost 20 billion years old. That means very, very old. Now, look at this very interesting statement. When we, when we are looking at the twinkling stars in the night sky, we are actually looking back in time. Let me read it once again. When we are looking at the twinkling stars in the night sky, we are actually looking back in time. Now why, why am I calling this statement very interesting is, as science students you know, when are we able to perceive any image? When the light falls on the, here I have shown a flower. So you can see the rays of the sun falling on this and then the object has to reflect that light and the reflected light has to reach the person's eyes and then only the image will be formed. So if I'm looking at this pen right now, the light which is reflected by this has to reach my eyes and then only I can perceive the image, okay? Now what about the stars? The distance between me and the stars is trillions of kilometers. So just imagine when I'm looking at these stars, I'm looking in the past because the journey of that light must have started several years back and now it has reached my eyes. So that's why the interesting statement and what is the significance of this statement? The significance is that the two objects, that means this planet and the stars, they're separated by a huge distance. So that also tells us how vast is the universe, fine? Now let's understand the origin of universe. Let us unfold the events one by one. The theory that explains origin of universe is called Big Bang Explosion, also called Big Bang Theory. What does it say? It says that everything began from a single dense compact point. That means that point was a single point and all the energies were packed into that and then some kind of explosion happened and with that explosion 
the matter was created and that matter got propelled outward fine so initially there was no matter it was just a compact dense point with all the energies packed inside now how this explosion happened that we do not know also what the, the big bang theory does not explain is from where this single tiny point came into existence okay but what it tells is yes there is explosion a huge unimaginable explosion and that created matter from that tiny point and everything was scattered and that's how came the concept of space and time so that means before the explosion there was no space and there was no concept of time fine let's see the second event so after the explosion all the matter started moving apart so indirectly i can say it expanded the universe expanded the distance between the two objects that matter started increasing in fact universe is expanding even today so as the universe started expanding the temperature also cooled down and what happens when the temperature cools down all the clouds of gases which were created through the explosion all of them started condensing and you know what happens when condensation occurs along with the scattered dust and this gases which were condensing they gave rise to the stars so because of the gravitational pull everything came together and this is how the birth of the stars took place how many stars billions of them and it is believed that it is this time that hydrogen and helium was form it was released into the universe one of the most primitive gases you can call so this way billions of stars were formed there was lot of dust there were lot of clouds of gases all of them got pulled together due to gravitational attraction and that is how the galaxies were born so today how many galaxies are there billions of them and one such galaxy is the milky way galaxy where our planet is found and where we live where life has originated where life has evolved okay the third event that i can explain here in big bang theory when initially the earth was formed as a part of this milky way galaxy it was not like how it is present today it was like this a molten mass there was no hard rocky surface everything existed either in the gaseous form or in a molten form there were lot of volcanic eruptions and what happened is from this molten mass gases like ammonia carbon dioxide methane and water vapors were released so this formed the early atmosphere of the primitive earth why am i calling it primitive earth that is because it is in this early a uh, stage of beginning and now let us see what happened to this water vapors while uh, the solar system was uh, beginning the formation was be, uh, happening we know that sun as well as the earth was being simultaneously created the uv rays which were sent by the sun it split up the water into what into oxygen and hydrogen now hydrogen is a very light gas it started escaping in the in the atmosphere and the free oxygen which was there it did not remain in free state it soon started reacting with the remaining gases now which are the remaining gases ammonia is there then we have the methane so you can see in the reaction it has reacted with that and in the bargain it has given more of carbon dioxide more of water vapors same way here now oxides are formed of nitrogen water vapors are formed and that was sent back into the atmosphere that means we can very well say the primitive earth or the primordial earth as we say did not have oxidizing kind of atmosphere it was called reducing type no free oxygen and abundant hydrogen fine now at the same time while all this was happening gradually the sun rays also started splitting this free oxygen into individual atoms and what happened to those individual atoms it reacted with 
oxygen molecule and gave rise to ozone. So this was the beginning of ozone formation. You can see the formula O3. How do you get O3? When we have three atoms of oxygen. That means the oxygen was split into individual atoms and then it collided with one oxygen molecule. So one oxygen molecule, one oxygen atom that gives up the formation of ozone. And that is how the beginning of ozone happened in the primitive condition of the earth. The fourth event. The fourth event is as time passed, I told you initially the temperature was unimaginably hot. But slowly as time went by, the temperature started cooling down. And what happened? We know that when temperature come down, the gases start condensing. Condensation is just the opposite of evaporation. So when gases start condensing, what will happen? They will turn into liquid state and it came down as rain. Okay. Now is it pure water? No. It wasn't pure water because the rain that came down, it started reacting with all the elements on the earth's crust, also in the atmosphere. So this must have happened for several years, millions of years, there must have been this kind of rain, torrential rain it is called. And what happened to that rain? It started filling up the depressions on the earth's surface like this. And you can say this was a step towards formation of this vast bodies called oceans. Clear? So that means if the temperature had not come down, all these events would not have taken place formation of rain, filling up the depressions. And why depressions were there is, understand the earth's crust was also initially in molten form. But as the time went by, as the temperature cooled down, this also solidified. And the depressions which were there were filled up with rain. And this was the, this was the reason why oceans were born on the surface of the earth. But it took again 500 million that means another 500 millions went by and then only the first life came into existence. So if I say that earth was created 4.5 million years ago, I can very well say that life came, earth was formed 4.5 million years ago, but the life came only 4 billion years ago, exactly after 500 millions later. Okay. So uh, let's just quickly revise what we have done. I said Milky Way galaxy is just one of the many galaxies in the universe. With so many stars, dust and gases. Our solar system which is part of this galaxy comprises sun, moon and other stellar objects like the comets, asteroids. How many planets are there? Earlier as uh, school children, we learned there were nine planets, but now we know Pluto being excluded, it is eight planets in the solar system. And because all are held, all these planets, all these stellar objects are held by gravity, that is how they become a part of one galaxy. Therefore, our Earth is just a speck. What is a speck? A speck is just a tiny dot or a tiny point in the entire vast universe and it originated somewhere 4.5 billion years back. 4.5 billion years back or you can also say 4,500 million years back. And life came 4,000 million years back or 4 billion years back. Now it is time for us to understand how life came into existence on this planet, on our Earth. But before that, let us just summarize the Big Bang Theory I'll give you some important points here so that you can very well write a note, essay type of note on Big Bang Theory because it can be asked for three marks. So what you need to remember here is huge explosion. Next point, that it started expanding, temperature came down. Then you need to remember the gas, naturally temperature came down, gases started condensing and that is how the present day galaxies were formed. Then talk about the Milky Way galaxy and also talk about the creation of Earth. Then 
you can mention that the earth had no atmosphere either say no atmosphere or you can also say reducing kind of atmosphere with all this primitive all this primitive gases okay then talk about the uv rays action of uv rays on the water vapors then also mention about that lighter hydrogen escape but the free oxygen could not remain free that is the reason why we are saying it wasn't oxidizing type it started reacting with others with the, with other compounds formation of ozone layer you can mention and then also mention that as time went by temperature came down to such an extent that the water vapors could actually go into liquid state and come down as rain and that was the reason why oceans are seen today and the last point appearance of life on this planet even if you do not mention appearance of life under big bang theory it's okay but these are the main points that you have to mention in big bang theory okay now that we have seen the creation of uh, universe then the creation of the planet let us see how the beautiful life came into existent on this beautiful planet various theories have been put forth the first one is called panspermia given by the greek philosophers according to them what they say is there must have been this kind of spores coming from some outer space and they were just scattered on the planet not only on the earth but other planets also that means life was there the spores were there on some outer space and they were down distributed on different planets and that is the reason why there is life on the planet but then this theory is totally discarded because there was no scientific proof for that the next theory is spontaneous generation what is spontaneous all of a sudden now see what this theory says that life came into existence from a non living matter all of a sudden also called abiogenesis you know what is abiotic factor non living so life came from non living matter especially rotten food or uh, rotten leaves decaying leaves and all this happened spontaneously so you can call this theory spontaneous generation and abiogenesis too now there was an, again there was no proof for this in fact there was an evidence to uh, to discard this theory and who gave this louis pasteur so what louis pasteur did is he took two glass flask now look at the flask they are very uh, different they have the mouth of this uh, it narrows down into a curved curved tube and he put yeast inside dissolve it in water sugar was added and he boiled this thoroughly the purpose of boiling was to kill any microbes and all if they are present in the flask okay so he left this uh, killed yeast inside just to see whether there would be any microbial growth and what he found is that most of the microbes got trapped here in the curved end now what he did is he cut the tube here exactly at this position and this setup was left open now this flask in the second situation has direct access to the open air and immediately what happened all the microbes could reach to the interior and that is how the microbial growth occurred very fast in the second situation so all this proved that if life has to emerge it has to emerge from the pre existing life and louis pasteur calls it biogenesis opposite of abiogenesis fine now there were several such experiments done let's see one more in fact we are making use of this kind of uh, concept in our kitchen what do we do we take a container and if you have to store something do we leave it open no first thing is we sterilize the glass bottle so that any microbes and all will be killed you might have seen your uh, mother uh, storing either jam or pickle first the glass has to be sterilized and then you don't leave it open you make it air tight or you cover it either with a lid or a cloth on the top so what happen in what happens in such cases is you will find that the bottle which is open will attract flies from outside they will go they will feed on that uh, decaying matter and organic matter i can say 
and they will start laying eggs. So maggots will come, maggots are the larvae. Maggots will come there. In the second one, you find there are no flies coming because even the smell is not going out. What about the third one? The flies are attracted because of the smell, but there is no entry for the, for the, la, for the mosquitoes to go inside and feed on the organic matter there. So all this actually proves that it is impossible that the life can come from non-living objects. Okay, and once and for all, this theory was discarded. Let's see the next one. Special creation theory. Now the word itself tells you special creation. That means the creation has been done by a special uh, divine power and we call it a supernatural power. Different religions believe in this theory. They may be giving different names to this supernatural power, but the ultimate uh, uh, thing is what? That the life and this planet was created by supernatural. I have directly come to the fourth point first. Now let's see how was it when it was created. All living organisms that we see today, they were created as such. Now this point tells you there, was, there is no modification, there is no change, there is uh, no evolution, everything existed as it is. The diversity that we see today also existed in the past and it will remain like this in future. So this uh, bi biodiversity, millions of species that we see in the, on this planet, they were all created right in the beginning. Nothing has become extinct, nothing has be uh, come later on. So this theory says that special creation through supernatural power. Again, there is no scientific evidence for that. So we'll move to the next theory. So this theory, very important point in special creation theory is Earth is only 4,000 years old. What does Big Bang theory says? Four, it is, it is 4.5 billion years ago that Earth was created. But according to this theory, only 4,000 years old. Fine. The next one that we are learning is chemical evolution theory. It was put forth by two scientists, Oparin and Haldane, no parent from Russia and Haldane from England. Now, they gave this theory and this theory is more or less accepted today because there is scientific proof for this. So first let us understand what they proposed. What they said is before the first cellular life came into existence, chemical evolution happened. That means before the first cells came, first life came, actually there was chemical evolution happening as, as a preparation for that first cellular life. So what is this chemical evolution? This is what they are saying. In the primitive atmosphere of the earth, there were abundant inorganic constituents like nitrogen we had, phosphorus, oxygen, all these components started reacting with each other. And when they reacted with each other, small organic compounds were formed. Like what? Like amino acids, nucleotides. I have shown only two here. You can even put here uh, a fatty, uh, fatty acids, glycerols, or you can also say uh, simple sugars like glucose. All these simple uh, organic compounds were formed through the reaction of these inorganic components. Now, from where did they get this? There has to be a source of energy if this reaction has to take place. Fine. So the source of energy according to Oparin and according to Haldane is at that time there was a high, uh, very high temperature. The high temperature served as the source of energy. Secondly, there was volcanic eruptions. So a lot of heat was emitted because of that too. Then there was lightning, lightning because of collision of huge clouds of gases. So that also served as a source of energy and this is what happened. Further, according to this scientist, this is what happened. Polymerization of amino acids into proteins. We have studied last year in 11th standard that when amino acids start binding uh, one after the other, like one amino acid, second amino acid, third amino acid, through peptide bonds, CONH bond, you get a long chain. So this is how the polypeptide chain or the proteins was formed. Similarly, the nucleotides also, the nucleotides also started polymerizing 
and give rise to nucleic acid dna and rna and here we uh, we are told that rna came much before dna rna is more primitive than than dna okay now what are these these proteins these nucleic acids they are giant molecules they are the building blocks of life we know that any uh, living body is made up of this very components that's why we call them building blocks of life so all these building blocks of life formation was a turning point and they happened to aggregate together all these giant molecules uh, you can say they were the complex organic compounds i have written proteins and nucleic acid you can also add fats you can also add uh, some other type of lipids you can also add into these polysaccharides and there came the formation of non cellular capsule it's not a cell it was not living it was just an aggregate of all these compounds together that is called non cellular capsule when did this happen around 3 billion years ago so this first this kind of non cellular capsules might have come 3 billion years back and then it's transformation into the first cellular life now what does a cell have it has a cell membrane it has definite organelles it brings about metabolic activities it can replicate from one cell it can become two so something like this must have happened by chance factor a membrane must have been formed through lipids we know now that the cell membrane chemical nature is what by phospholipid so this kind of a limiting boundary must have come metabolic actions must have must have taken place must have replicated and there came around 2 billion years ago the first cellular life on this planet fine so in brief if i have to put chemical evolution theory i will say organic molecules reacted to give simple organic molecules simple organic molecules reacted gave complex organic compounds all the complex organic compounds they aggregated together and started behaving as the precursors of life by chance factor membrane must have come metabolic action must have you know begun and that is how from the chemical evolution where it ended came the first cellular life into existence we don't mention about the cellular life here even if you mention up to the precursors of life or you can call them proto cells the 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 raw material for the formation of the actual cells this is what happened in the chemical evolution now why should we believe all this we should believe this because there is a scientific evidence for this and who gave the scientific evidence scientific evidence there is one scientist called miller we'll come to that but just quickly we'll go through this i told you non cellular life non cellular capsules of life that's chemical evolution by chance factor first cell must have been formed right and that cell once formed must have become multicellular many cells must have come together and something like multicellular uh, structure must have been formed multicellular became tissue level tissue became organ level organ became organ system more and more complexity and what is actually happening when i'm saying all this is biological evolution so what happened on the primitive earth is chemical evolution but what happened later is the biological evolution because of which we have this entire biodiversity fine so on the other side i've shown you how amino acids nucleotides they came together gave rise to the uh, to the proteins dna rna all aggregated together and then came the cellular life now if you look at this it is believed that the prokaryotes came much before the eukaryote so the first cell was prokaryotic cell fine let's come to the experiment the experiment is called miller's experiment to prove chemical evolution put forth by oparin and haldane now this uh, uh, this particular experiment though it is called miller's experiment let me tell you he miller was a student of yuri and yuri has guided him in this experiment and this entire setup was made up of glass the apparatus made by miller in his laboratory was having 
glass tubes connected to two chambers. One is a small chamber and one is the big chamber. Have a close, at, close look at this. You can find there are uh, gases filled up in this chamber. So it is also called a reaction chamber or the gas chamber and it is bigger one as compared to the small chamber. The small chamber has water continuously boiled. So that will bring about a high temperature within this setup almost 800 degree centigrade. Also because of boiling of water, water vapors will be created and they will enter into this gas chamber. So what all gases are present? Ammonia, methane, water vapors and hydrogen and we know that they are the primitive gases. Primordial earth had this kind of gases. Fine. Now electrodes were fitted into the gas chamber. These electrodes were creating sparks. So this is like you know to imitate the action of the lightning as a source of energy. All the gases which were present here naturally gases, gas molecules have a lot of kinetic energy. They will start moving uh, from that chamber. They will try to escape and come into this tube. Now into the tube when it passes you see outside the tube there is a condenser fitted. So the cold water goes inside and that is responsible for creating a cooling action. And when gases cool what happens? They start undergoing condensation. So same thing happened all these gases as they were moving they started condensing they started reacting with each other and all the liquid samples got collected here. And within a time of seven to eight days Miller when he opened this trap there's a trap here where you can remove the samples. So when he removed the samples what did he find? He found in this setup amino acids. So I have highlighted it in yellow color. So he found amino acids in this trap. Now he had not added amino acid. What he had added was all these primitive gases. So according to him reaction must have taken place because of two sources of energy. One is the heat almost 800 degree centigrade I told you and the second is the electric sparks and all these primitive gases in this source of light in, in this source of energy started reacting and when more such experiments were done they found that not only amino acid sugars were formed, nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, uracil all these were formed but besides that fats were formed, pigments were formed somewhat like chlorophyll pigments and this actually proved that yes chemical evolution might have taken place on the planet on the primitive planet on the primitive earth okay so Miller's experiment was the first evidence that organic molecules needed for the life could be formed from inorganic components that is what the chemical evolution of Oparin and Haldin says okay now that we have seen evidences for chemical evolution we will also find evidences for biological evolution so there are three. One is paleontological evidence, homologous organs, analogous organs. Homologous and analogous organs, you can explain them under comparative morphological and anatomical evidences. That means you are comparing organs of two or more organisms. So you are comparing basically their morphology, external features. And if it is anatomy, it is the internal structures. Fine. If I'm talking about heart, if I'm talking about the bone, uh, bony skeleton and all, I'm talking about anatomy. So this kind of comparison is done to get evidences. So let's come to paleontological evidences. Paleos means ancient. So you can very well understand looking at the slide, this evidences must be from fossils. What are fossils? They are the hard remnants of the past organisms. Okay. Now, should it be only the hard parts? We know that fossils need not be only bones or the claws or the teeth. They could also be impressions like this. Imprints they are called. You can see this here. Yeah? It's a leaf imprint. So when the surface was wet, the leaf might have fallen there. And then as it solidified, the 
leaf left behind its imprint. So I can very well make out whether it is a dicot or a monocot leaf looking at the pattern of the veins. And that's a dicot leaf, right? So same way, many reptiles, many invertebrates also got fossilized. So beside the imprints and these hard parts, even fecal pellets, they also can turn into fossil. Eggs also, hair also can be fossilized. So if I have to write paleontological evidence note, what all things will I write here? First thing you speak about what are these fossils and where are they formed? In the sedimentary rocks. Now if you have studied in your lower classes, sedimentary rocks have different strata, that is layers. Each layer once formed, deposition of next layer happened. So all the fossils were found in this kind of, mainly in this kind of sedimentary rocks. So as I said, fecal pellets, impressions, eggs can also be fossilized. Different aged rocks, sediments contain fossils of different forms which died during the formation of that particular segment. So this shows that when we explore each layer and if we happen to find fossils in each layer, what we come to know is the different aged rocks, that means the age of the rock can actually be traced through a technique called radioactive carbon dating. So if I know the age of the rock, I also know the age of that organism now which has become a fossil, right? So I can actually find out when exactly this organism existed, okay? And when exactly it died to become a fossil there. Some of these have become already extinct. Look at this picture here. Here. So that's a woolly mammoth skeleton, very closely resembling the present day elephants, but it is no more present. So it has become extinct, shows similarities to the present life forms. Life forms varied over time. It wasn't the same kind of organisms. Different types of organisms came into existence. Some were restricted only to certain geological time spans. Let us say if I'm trying to explore which organisms are found in different layers. Let us say I find a particular kind of uh, fossil in the first layer, maybe in the second layer also, but then later on I don't find it. If I don't find the existence of that fossil later on, not only in one rock, when we make a study overall, we don't find it in the successive layers. So it also shows that that organism must have lived only at that particular time period of the earth. And I will give you one, this, one example here, Nimbadan. Nimbadan organism lived before, you can also take dinosaurs as example. Dinosaurs also lived for a particular duration and then they were not found. Okay, so that's about the paleontological evidences. So these are the sedimentary rocks. So you can see the different layers here. Let's study the next evidence. The next evidence, as I told you, is homologous organs and analogous organs. Let's see the definition of homologous organs. So if I compare organism A with organism B, and when I match their certain organs, what I find here is the organs show so much of similarity, there's a striking resemblance, but both these organs are used for different function. So what is the definition of homologous organ? They're similar in origin and has same basic pattern, basic structure, but function varies. Analogous organs on the other hand, suppose if I say these two organisms are showing analogous organs. These organs are similar in function, but they are nowhere related by basic structure. They do not share any basic pattern. That means, they are just opposite to homologous organ, but both are very important in understanding evolution. We'll see how. So the homologous organs, it is believed, they suggest common ancestry. Why? Because the basic plan is the same, basic structure is the same. So they indicate common ancestry, whereas analogous organs indicate that they are totally unrelated by descent. That means there was no common ancestor for them. Further, one more thing we come to know, through this common ancestry, now what has happened over a period of time is, 
organisms have gone in different lifestyles they have diversified from the common stock so look at the arrows shown there what does it look like as if they are diverging from a common point and where are they diverging to different kinds of lifestyles okay so what about the analogous organs analogous organs if you look at the arrows started from different unrelated groups but all of them are showing the same kind of lifestyle so homologous organs as i said it indicates common ancestry i can also call it divergent evolution look at the arrows that itself tells you from one stock diversification took place whereas analogous organs show convergent evolution totally unrelated but so many of these unrelated organisms have gone towards the same lifestyle that's called convergent evolution so this becomes the second evidence that yes life has evolved i'll give you some pictures so that you remember better so i've shown here a mammals like human beings cheetah whale bat is shown all of them i say they have come from common ancestry we'll just see one example to prove this when i study their bone patterns look at the bone patterns of the forelimb there is humerus the humerus is the first bone parallel bones radius ulna then the wrist bones those are the here yeah, wrist bones carpal then the metacarpal and then the phalanges you will see striking similarities in the forelimb of cheetah there is humerus there is slight modifications may be there same way in the flippers of the whale surprisingly whale showing similar features though it is uh, adapted for aquatic mode same way bat in its wing shows similar bone pattern only thing you can see the carpals and the metacarpals have become quite long because that has to form into a wing okay so though there are small changes small variation but the basic pattern is the same so these are called the homologous organs and they prove divergent evolution that means functions have become different what the bird does it with its uh, wing the flipper cannot do what the flipper does the forelimb of the cheetah cannot do and what our forelimbs do do the manipulative kind of task that cannot be done by any of this organism so the functions vary so i have show i will show you some examples right now so you can see this bone pattern so this is the bone structure of the forelimb of human being the humerus is there the radius ulna is there the carpals are there and the metacarpal phalanges now look at this this is the forelimb of a frog isn't there a striking similarity same bone pattern but we know what frog does it with its forelimb what what frog does with its forelimb human can human being cannot do okay so the basic structure is same these are homologous organs and if you have to see the bat wing now this is inside a jar so if you have already seen a bat wing you will know that there are bone patterns here very much similar to this bone pattern so all these three this this is the frog frog is also a vertebrate frog forelimb all these are homologous organs indicating divergent evolution clear students something like this is found even in the plants let's see if it is true i have given the example of bougainvillea with the thorns on it and the cucurbita that is a pumpkin pumpkin plant showing tendrils look at the tendrils here see so these are the tendrils spring like structures and in bougainvillea these are the thorns plenty thorns these are very common plants at one or the other time you must have seen this now how are they homologous it is believed that both are homologous because the thorns and the tendrils they are the modified stems 
they have come from the axillary bud modification that means the origin is the same but function has become different what is the function of the tendril it acts as a support for the plant to climb up okay in fact you can see here in the surrounding there must have been a mono there this grass you can see so it is twining around the grass taking a support and climbing up whereas the function of the thorns is to provide a protection against grazing and browsing animals so functions different but the basic plan is the same okay now we saw homology homology is the uh, is the concept where we talk about homologous organs homology we saw at the morphological level we saw it at the anatomical level now let us see homology at the molecular level similarities of biochemicals similarity of biochemical in different organism indicate common ancestry what kind of what kind of similarity are we talking about here let's take examples it will be clear let's talk about the hemoglobin structure hemoglobin the globin part here is a protein hem is the iron portion so if you compare the globin part of hemoglobin in different organism let us say in monkeys or let us say in apes and let us say in human being there's a striking similarity in the sequence of amino acid because protein is made up of amino acid same way you can take many other example you can take the example of genes genes are made up of nucleotide sequences so same kind of sequences you will find in different organism in their gene so this also shows biochemical evidences of evolution you can take example of salivary amylase enzyme salivary amylase which breaks down starch into maltose same salivary amylase is also found in lower organisms the structure is the same so these are all homologous uh, either organs you can say or homology at the molecular level proving that yes common ancestry and then divergent evolution let's come to analogous organs so analogous organs what was the definition i said they are organs which have different developmental plan basic structure is not the same but what is common the function is common so i have given some examples here sweet potato and potato one is a root the sweet potato is a root it has come from the radical whereas the potato is a modified stem this is our 11th standard knowledge both have common function of storing food they are underground and they store food for the plant if i have to take example in animals i will take example of wings wings of insect like butterfly or a cockroach or i can uh, take any other insect and i compare it with the wings of birds when i compare them what i find here is though the function is common that is both are used for flying they are not at all related let me show you so this is the insect wing when i touch it i don't find any muscles i don't find any uh, nerves i don't find any uh, blood vessels but when i touch if i have to touch the wing of a bat definitely i can see that there is a bone pattern there is a musculature there will be blood vessel so both are analogous but the function is common structure is different what kind of evolution convergent evolution both of them ultimately have converged to the same lifestyle that is flight so analogous organs shows adaptation of unrelated organisms now there are many other evidences also to prove that yes evolution has taken place though not mentioned in your textbook quickly i will go through them one is the embryological evidences and one is vestigial organs embryological evidences look at the embryos of fish reptile birds and humans so much of similarity gill slits are present in all tail present in all okay this is at the embryological stages but what happens is as they as they complete their further development they become totally different the very fact that at embryo level they are showing similarities it proves common ancestry that means there must have been a common ancestor for all this organism 
it is believed that if you mix all the embryo it will be difficult to make out which one is of reptile which one is of fish which one is of bird same way vestigial organ becomes one more evidence vestigial organs are all those organs in human beings which are no more in use but they are present the very fact that they are present it shows that they might have been present in our ancestors but over a period of time because they are not required now they have been disused for so many generations and they are therefore become rudimentary rudimentary meaning what they are there may not be completely formed but the presence is there proving that we have evolved from some ancestors so i'll give you some example the nictitating membrane in your eyes similar kind of membrane is found in frogs to cover the the eyeball but in us only a small remnant is present there similarly the wisdom tooth or you can take the example of vermiform appendix all these are vestigial organs but in your textbook the main thing that is given to you here is the paleontological evidence then the homologous analogous organs fine so students we have finished up to the evidences and this is the part 1 of evolution the part 2 will be continued in the next lecture prudent scholars powered by lupin pharmaceuticals अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस